This show is brought to you by Interesting Radio. You can find all our shows over at interestingradio.nz. Welcome to the Home Assistant Podcast, episode number seven. I'm Dan, and joining me today is Rohan. Hey, how's it going? Hey, good. Thanks for joining me bright and early for you. <laughs> That's right. It's uh, it's not super early. It's still 7.30, so it could, could be worse. Yeah, that's true. And yeah, 11.30 p.m. for me, which is kind of the other side of unpleasant, but that's all right. <laughs> well, that's, that's the fun thing about doing these international podcasts, right? Community-based. Yeah, people all over the world in all sorts of interesting time zones. Exactly. Because... Eastern's what, minus eight or minus six? Uh, minus five. Minus five, yeah, because we're plus 12. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Messy. Yeah, but make it work. Yeah, absolutely. We always seem to manage to find a time that works for people. Exactly. All right, so as we usually do, there's been a release since we recorded last, which was 0.52. Uh, there are a total of 78 pull requests merged for this release, which is a pretty good effort. Yeah. Especially uh, considering that, you know, it's kind of summer holidays for, or well, summer holidays are kind of just wrapping up um, over in your side of the world. Yeah, it's 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 interesting because I always, I find like it's constantly like more and more, right? It's like people are pushing themselves further. So um, it's, it's having more pull requests uh, merged in and, and just people coming out with more modules and stuff like that, which is very neat. So yeah, massive, definitely big shout out to the community. Yeah. Massive props to Palos and his community team that, you know, merge all the pull requests and do all that kind of work. Cause it, it's gotta be a mammoth effort, you know, dealing with 78 pull requests in two weeks. Yeah. 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 It's very impressive. Um, couple of big things in this release. Uh, scripts editor has come along. So that's quite nice. So it's, uh, I pretty I presume they just went, let's pick up the automation editor, take a copy of it and make some probably very slight changes to it. And be able to edit scripts as well. Um, so yeah, I need to try that still. You haven't used the automation editor yet? Uh, no, I'm talking about the scripts editor. The automation uh, editor, I haven't either. Just honestly, I, I looked at it once and I'm like, eh, I already have most of my automations built out. I don't want to... I don't want to mess that up right now. So, but now, you know, now that my, uh, my home assistant, uh, as I mentioned to you offline kind of fell over, uh, my, my VM died, my Linux VM died. So I'm going to rebuild it, uh, rebuild some of it. And I might, I might, uh, play with both the editors that way. Yeah. And I'm doing the same thing. Um, I pretty much just deleted my entire configuration and went, let's start again. And it's been so much more stable. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm not really using automations heaps, um, cause I'm using app daemon, but there are some things like, um, unlocking doors that I'm using with automations because they're just that tiny little bit faster. There's mm -hmm. just a slight less bit of latency and for, yeah, for things like, you know, motion on lights, the initial bit at least. And, you know, when I swipe a tag on a reader, I want the door to unlock pretty much instantly, especially if I'm carrying stuff. Yeah. <clears throat> no, I hear you. Yeah. Um, eight new components. Um, most of them are just, you know, new components that people have added um, for various bits and pieces. But there was one, which is the version sensor. So I think that gives mm -hmm. you about five or six different ways you can get um, into, you know, your home assistant uh, data plane, I guess what version of Home Assistant you're running. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what? The, the cool thing about the version sensor is um, you can actually, again, now you can automate, uh, again, a little more, another way, um, how you um, how you update uh, Home Assistant, right? So you can even have it like self-healing or self-updating rather, not self-healing. Yeah. Uh, you've been, you can have it self-updating and have an automation where you say, okay, well, you know, if it doesn't match this, then then... Um, you know, do uh, do a GitHub pull or not a GitHub yep. pull, do a Docker pull, mm. right? And 
And then you Go wake up in the so. morning and it's tried to update itself and it's toasted itself and then you have to fix it. <laughs> yeah, as as long as you wake up in the morning and uh, it's not because all of your lights turned on <laughs> randomly, <laughs> <True>. you're good. <laughs> yeah, it's the last thing you need. Three o'clock in the morning, all your lights and your TV and your media players all suddenly burst into life. It, it, exactly, everything is just full tilt. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and 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 you're yelling, you're yelling at your uh, voice platform. <laughs> Shut yelling the hell at Google up. Home, or exactly. <laughs> yeah, um, breaking changes. Um, they apparently they they've removed spaces from the Xiaomi Switch attributes. Um, so if you're using those in automations, there might be a couple of changes that you need to make to actually make sure that you're still getting all the things that you want through. Um, and the MQTT switch, which I use a lot, the uh, command and availability payloads are no longer linked. So there was a, you know, command payload for on and off, um, and that was also tied to, you know, the availability. So you, if you know you were getting messages, you could see that you know this the whatever device controls the switch is available and ready to receive commands. So those have been split out, so you can actually yeah. see it separate ones which is kind of handy yeah i was just gonna say because then again decoupling that actually gives you a few benefits so that's that's actually pretty neat to to hear that mm. that's happening and that's especially you know that everyone loves the son off switches which are empty mm-hmm. switches so that's yeah good to see i really need to order some of those yeah well again even <clears throat> MQTT is one of my favorite ways of <laughs> communicating with Home Assistant, right? Like, uh, even my switches. So, uh, I think I mentioned this in the first episode where, so I'm doing smart things as well as Home Assistant. Mm. And the uh, the smarter smart things essentially leverages uh, MQTT in the background, right? To communicate between smart things and, uh, mm-hmm. and Home Assistant as a, as a, as a messaging bus. Yeah. So, I think that uh, MQTT is a fantastic way of uh, of communicating, and even if you're building custom sensors and stuff, MQTT is super easy. So, yeah, exactly. Um, I built a leak detector with an ESP uh, with an Arduino controller, mm. and again, it's easiest thing to say, <laughs> "Hey, you know, I detect a water. I didn't detect water. Perfect, done." Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right? And then have Home Assistant act on that. So, yeah, if if you know, if if the world hasn't tried it, I highly suggest you should try it. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I actually um, had to set up another integration over the weekend, which is the um, HomeKit integration. So we now and bought yeah. myself a new lock, um, and it uses HomeKit. I didn't know that the you actually use an Apple TV as your HomeKit hub, which I thought was kind of cool. Yeah. Well, it's it's. I think Apple's logic uh, is it prevents you from needing another box mm. right um so i think i think that's one of those huge kind of things for apple where yeah we could sell another box but <laughs> at this point because i think one of the things and, and we talked about this a few episodes ago as well is um kind of the wars between siri and the google home and and um the amazon echo mm. And Apple's kind of falling behind in that world, right? Um, even if you look, you know, and look online and stuff, m- most people are using either the Echo or or Google Home. So I, I think it's just from an access to to the technology perspective. I think it just made broke down one of those barriers for Apple. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, being able to you know go, hey Siri, unlock the back door as I'm walking up to the back door, and my phone in my pocket goes. I've unlocked the back door for you. It's really handy. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Yeah. Which which could also be <laughs> which could also be bad too, right? Um, you don't. Uh, I was I was reading an article. This is a while ago. I was reading it. Uh, I'm sure some others out there have read it too. Where basically some guy yelled, "Unlock my front door!" Like some guy's neighbor yelled, "Unlock my front door!" Because he wanted flour or something from the from his neighbor's kitchen, <laughs> and it was like okay. And then and I, I, I believe it was on Neko. Oh, that's not uh, good. That it did that, and then uh, and the guy came in and was like left a note or something like that. I was like, "Hey, by the way, 
L- luckily, it wasn't it wasn't for a malicious yeah. intent, right? <laughs> so uh, it was it was something a little funnier, which is, hey, I need flour, I need eggs, or something like that. I, I forget exactly what it was, but which it, it's still pretty funny, right? But it, it's but that also does bring in an actual um, logic about, hey, I yeah. need there's certain commands that I want to lock down and not allow, right? Yeah, exactly. I don't think I'd. Yeah, I'm I'm okay with it on my phone because I've usually got my phone on me and it's not you know sitting inside the house behind a locked door. Yeah, but I don't think I would put door unlocking or you know security functions on a Echo or a Google Home. Yeah, exactly. Hmm. Right, I think that that's pretty much it for five two, and no doubt there'll be more interesting things in five three. Mm-hmm. Um, we had an email from someone. Um, Again, I can't remember who it was because it's been a little while. Um, <laughs> but someone asked um, if we could, you know, do a shout out for some home automation blogs that um, people can have a read of. So I've got five. Um, mm-hmm. First up is Brian Cripps, who's a community member. I think he's a, a mod as well. Um, yes. And he's got a home automation um, section on his blog and he's got... A pretty impressive variety of bits and pieces um, that he's running, so you can go in there and have a read. Um, I'm not going to list the URLs vocally, <laughs> yeah, um, but they'll all they're, be they're in, the in the show notes. notes. Yeah. <clears throat> Apparently, he has 13 dash buttons. Wow! And can That's cool. Buy another one because 13 doesn't sound like a good number. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, up next on my list is your blog. Hey, there we go. Got a cool <laughs> shout out. Um, yeah, I don't have a ton of stuff uh, on it yet, but uh, I will. <laughs> yeah. I've I've also got, I've already got a couple of articles hashed out, so fantastic. Just a matter of actually popping it up there. Yeah. <laughs> um, then we've got Phil. Um, his blog. Um, mm-hmm. I note that. Uh, four out of five of the actually all of these are actually technology blogs, not home automation blogs, and they've kind of <laughs> got a a side topic for automation. Yeah, the the photo that Phil's got um on the header of his blog is pretty cool. I don't know if that's his yeah. place or not. I was, I was gonna, I was actually gonna, I was actually gonna mention that. Um, and I, I'm just looking at Phil's site right now, and I'm like, wow, that's a that's a really nice place. <laughs> I wish my house was that organized and that clean. So, yeah, and the, Phil, if that's your if that's your place, good for you, man. Yeah, and the accent lighting and everything is really cool. That's something I need to do is get some LED strips and do some accent lighting. Yeah, I think the next time I talk to Phil, uh, I'm going to ask him to just redecorate my house. <laughs> he is he's on holiday at the moment, which is fun. For him. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Like, who's going to be on the podcast this week? He's like, sorry, I'm kind of away <laughs> for a month. I'm like, oh, nice for some. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's funny because I don't think Phil and I have been on the same episode for, I think, like four episodes now. It's just oh, wow. between yeah. me traveling and him traveling, so. Yeah, and I'm I'm just always here. <laughs> uh, up next to course is Carlo's blog. Um, yeah. He's served as such an inspiration for all of us. Oh, it looks like he's just recently put up a new post. Um, Multi room audio on the Echo. Yeah, so I was actually trying that out yesterday, but for whatever reason, I did not have the option on my Echo for it. But um, yeah, so that should be pretty neat. But yeah, no, um, Carlo's blog is awesome. It's one of the ones that I follow and try and actually, you know, try and implement some of the things. Mm. Um, Carlo's pretty far ahead of me (laughs) relative to (laughs) where I am uh, when it comes to home automation, but uh it's definitely a really good site for um, for for getting ideas and just kind of pushing the boundaries too a little bit. So mm, yeah, absolutely. Um, and lastly, is my blog. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm I'm pretty slick about posting. Um, I really need to do some <laughs> do some project logs for some of the automation stuff that I've implemented recently. Um, but yeah. the the headline post at the moment is the studio for this podcast. So if you're interested in seeing all the the kit that I use for producing these shows, you can actually see that on my blog at the moment. Yeah, that's really neat. It's, yeah, a bit over the top, (laughs) but that's okay. (laughs) I I think you need more screens, though. I I don't don't know if the four or five screens you have there is enough. 
Uh, how many is it? One, <laughs> two, three, four. So I've got five like monitors and then two laptop screens as well. That's crazy. And I usually bring my uh, laptop in as well when I'm doing podcast recording. Yeah, fair enough. The and and actually one one other one I uh, I can give a shout out to. And so when I moved into my place, uh, this actually helped me quite a bit. Uh, it's another Canadian uh, from what I can tell with the URL. Uh, it's a guy named Jeremy Fan. Uh, it's the SmartHome.ca. It's a uh, he really goes through. Hey, here's what home and home automation is, and he basically blogged out his entire experience of moving into his condo and oh wow, uh, and and uh, basically everything he's done. He's got a big change log in there, and it's it's actually really neat. Um, so I, I highly recommend, especially if you're new to home automation, that's a really good one to check out as well. Did you say smarthome.ca? The smarthome.ca, uh-huh. yeah, yeah, because smarthome.ca is some shop. <laughs> yeah yeah no it's yeah don't don't forget the, the dhe so but yeah um I that I, that, that's another one that i found was really cool as well i have not come across that one so i've got some reading to do apparently yeah he it, it's basically a website dedicated to his build so wow how cool that's a massive log look at this i, I know wow <laughs> Yeah, and 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 it's oh. he seems to be updating it uh, more regularly than I'm updating my blog. So there you go. That is so cool. Mm-hmm. Look at all, and it's he's like backing just like mountains of stuff on Kickstarter. Yeah, and and <laughs> again, it's for for me, it's neat too because um, a lot of the time he talks about, hey, here's where you get it in Canada because not everything is available f- for shipping uh, from the U.S. on Amazon.com for me. Sure. Um, so it's a little more localized for uh, for that as well. So which is pretty mm, cool. Nice. And then yeah. All right. I think that is it for the two of us, at least. Um, yeah. I have a uh, coming up um, before the end of the show is a pre-recorded interview I did with uh, one of our listeners, um, Tim. He lives here locally in Dunedin, and we talked a bit about what he's doing with Home Assistant and um, IFTTT and things like that and what he's planning to do in the future as well. So it was good to, you know, hear what he's up to and plan out a bit of what he's going to do in the future. That's perfect. Yeah, so thanks for coming on with me at reasonably short notice to knock out this bit of the episode and we'll jump into the interview. That's perfect. Take care. All right, so hi, Tim. Hello, Dan. How are you? Oh, well, thanks for popping around and coming on. Oh, it was a chore. <laughs> yes, I'm very sorry about that. That's all right. Comfort zone, you know. Yeah, oh, absolutely. It's good to, it's definitely pulled me out of being reserved doing this podcast thing. True, definitely. Yeah. Um, so tell me a bit about what you're using Home Assistant for. Not a lot. Uh, the main things are in my lounge where I've got a Wemo switch through... Mm-hmm. Um, home assistant to be turned on when my amplifier is on or when the amplifier is on playing something, a couple of different states. Um, the couple of the other things is a wee bit of lighting around the place. So when the TV turns on, it turns a, a Philips Hughes LED strip. LED strip around the TV. Ah. And of course with Kodi, it's got a nice little plug-in that makes it illuminate different colours as you're watching a movie or TV or whatever. How's the latency on that? Um, it's not too bad. Uh, hmm. The biggest problem is, of course, it's only one strip, so you've got the same colour around the whole TV. Some of the better ones you can have uh, you know, yeah. many different zones hmm. around the around the TV. That would be kind of cool. But uh, you'd have to have a wee, a wee box of tricks playing that <laughs> or, yeah. Um, and then, of course, just a couple of other lights in the lounge or in the dining area and things like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think you can get the, you know, like four LED strips for the four corners and you plug the HDMI through it in it. Yeah. And it does the color. Yeah, did right. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, one, it's like I haven't got the, you can make the, the colors really intense or just a, a slight shade. Uh, okay. And that's pretty much what I've got with it. Just a wee bit of shading mm-hmm. just to give it a bit more colour around the edges of the TV. Mm, that's interesting. I wonder if there's, yeah, because I, I use an Apple TV, so 
I'd probably have to have some kind of external box for it. Yeah, it, it is just a, a add-on into Kodi, mm. and it just talks with the Hue bridge, yeah. and away it goes. Um, there's quite a distance between the two boxes, but it works. Mm. You know, it's, yeah, kind of cool. Yeah, that is pretty cool. Yeah, cool. Um, and you're talking a bit about IFTTT and some automations with you know getting yeah. home and things like that. Yeah, I've got it to a point where it now knows that I'm arriving home mm. so my wi-fi on the phone gets turned back on some of the things i want to do with that is use it to have some presence as i arrive at home turn on a, a driveway light if it is after sunset sort of thing mm. um or maybe during the course of the day making sure things are off if nobody's at home right yeah um, and using you know the the location as opposed to whether i'm up at home on the Wi-Fi, because mm. there is a wee bit of a delay there um, between when I get hooked on to the Wi-Fi and Home Assistant realising that I've actually arrived home. Right. Yeah, because Home Assistant can hook into, you know, have you got it hooked into Unify? Oh, well, yes. No, yes. Yeah, every, yeah. Everything that's smart, all my Unify um, USG and the switches and all that, yep. absolutely. Yeah, I, I made the mistake of adding it in with auto-add devices turned on. So I ended up with over 100 devices that it was tracking presents for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I turned that off a long time ago, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I had to go through and clean it up. Yeah, I still do have a couple of devices that it doesn't know the friendly name. Yeah. And so it's got the MAC address or some other <laughs> silly address on there. Yeah. But we'll sort that out. Yeah, it's very much a long-term project, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. You Learning YAML. That mm. was that was a mission. <laughs> uh, if there's one thing that the devs could help, that would be to mm, make it a wee bit easier there. But yeah, do you know Python? Uh, not much. Okay. Uh, yeah. Tweet tweaked a couple of scripts, and that's about it. Yeah, because yeah, I'm using App Demon, so all my automations happen in Python scripts. Yep. Um, and that's quite nice. Yeah. Oh, show me later. Yeah. <laughs> you uh, yeah. you've taken a more stable approach. I'm going to call it to your automation. Because yours actually uh, seem pretty reliable. Yeah, yeah. Although one of the updates from might have been four nine to fifty or something like that broke all the automations. Ah. Um, so I had to figure what was going out there, and it was pretty much just um, there was a change from having the automations inside the main configuration script to having having to have them outside. Yeah. And yeah, when I copied and pasted, it didn't quite work right. <laughs> It's my, my newbiness, if you like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mine is in a state where I am iterating quite quickly and a lot of things kind of work and kind of don't. Um, I'm working on getting them reliable, um, but it's taking some time, so I'm having to make sure that there's manual options as well. Yeah. With, with the number of iterations that are going on, does it make the database size bigger? I don't think so. The, the only things I'm storing in the database is my history. Um, everything else is just in the configuration files um, and my, all my configs in Git as well um, in a public repo so you know you can actually go and look and see what I'm up to on the website or just separately uh, just separately just on GitHub yeah, yeah. There's, on the website some of those example configurations are pretty impressive oh yes they are oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. Then, then of course I've got um, the uh, Harmony Writes mm-hmm I've um, got one of the elite ones, so that does quite a few things. And Home again, Home Assistant again knows what I'm doing, whether it's watching TV or watching the movies. Um, and I want to get that to do something. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe when I change state from watching a just a TV show to a movie, getting the lights to dim, mm. to certain, turn certain ones off. Yep. Yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah. Yeah, the Harmony remotes are pretty cool. Um, even standalone, they can control a lot of home automation kit, like Q and all sorts of things. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've had three different Harmony remotes over the years. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. And the Elite is certainly, at the moment, the best one. Yeah, mm. uh, because yeah, it can do the the flips Q, and it can do some plugs, but not the the Wemo type plugs. Yeah, so. yeah. I picked up a picked up an Elite for half off oh, from nice. Harvey Norman, so yeah. that was good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it it helps not to lose the remote because you always want to put it back on the cradle because otherwise next time you get to use it, it's flat, flat. and it's no good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you st- I still got it on the phone. 
so mm. it can still do basically everything. But yeah, you got to you are reliant on the on the uh, the remote to be fully charged because they don't last long. No, it's it's very much you know kind of smartphone esque battery. Yeah, yeah, a few days. Mm. That'd be about it. Yeah. Um, whereas the first Harmony remote I had, that would have been oh, a month, if not more. Wow. Yeah. Easy. Mm. Yeah. That would have been no screen or. Uh, no, 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 nice, colourful screen. Just mm. the basic text screen to say do mm. this, do that, yeah. and just infrared. No Wi-Fi, no Bluetooth, no nothing. Yeah, so it was. There's no hub. It was just point no. the remote at the device and yep. push the button. Yep, plug it into yep. the computer to program it up uh, through a, a horrible app on the computer. <laughs> and, but it, it worked a charm, and it was great. You know, the, yeah. the macros you can do with it, knowing what devices are on and off. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, it's it ha- it's having trouble with changing the inputs on my TV because um, I've got a. Play Chromecast and a playful TV option, and the only difference between the two is that one sets one HDMI input and one sets another. Mm. But for some reason, it, even though I'm put it, I put like a ten second delay in, so it gives the TV time to wake up. It's not actually um, observing the delay; it's sending the channel request straight away. Okay, I'm not quite sure why. Uh, you can do a, a another delay on the on the the remotes app as well for just a time to delay, as opposed to wait between Wi-Fi signals to send out or, or infrared signals okay. to send out. Yeah. Mm. I have to have a play with it, I'm sure. It's probably something I'm doing wrong. <laughs> There's, yeah, so many things that can be done. Mm. Uh, it's great. Yeah, and with the, the remotes, that's probably where I got more involved or interested in the home assistant or the home automation type things. Mm. You know, tying everything together, making it all work together. Yeah, yeah I guess that's a... You have all these options now like you controlled everything with a remote or with voice or so you've, you've got you've got being able to turn your tv on from your phone with yeah okay google, google assistant turn on my yeah. phone i'll turn on my tv and yeah. yeah it turns all that on um and again that's just using the the devices and the toys that you've got mm. it hasn't there's nothing more um uh, yeah yeah sometimes there's no you don't need complicated stuff in home assistant because home assistant's really good at monitoring the state as well so if it's faster to get iftct to talk directly to things then mm. yeah i don't see why you wouldn't yeah that was the the easy approach and i know home assistant does have a, a voice input um and i'll mm. play with that because that keeps it within within the network yes you know, whereas with iftt it's outside your network and you're reliant on you know, the internet, mm. and if that breaks, heaven forbid, um, <laughs> you know, things aren't going to work, things are going to break. Yes, pro- I, I, when I was using IFTTT, I found there was quite a bit of latency. Yeah, uh, there would have been maybe a two seconds sort That's of thing. not too bad. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's too much if it's a light switch and you're walking into a room. Yeah, you want that on pretty much straight away. Yeah. Um, I was looking on one of the websites before, there's... Um, the Xiaomi have got a, a presence switch that also talks to Home Assistant now. Mm. Um, that'd be kind of cool. Uh, it's got a wee light on it. Walk into a room, the light comes on, something else happens. Yeah, you know, that'd be that'd be neat. Yeah, there's still the room-based presence is still a challenge. Um, I've found that I've had to combine multiple things to get it accurate. Um, one of them being time. Um, from motion, uh, the easiest way to do it is to, you know, after 45 minutes of not detecting any motion, turn the lights back off. Yeah. Sometimes that's a problem. <laughs> if you're watching a movie. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's why we use eye beacons as well. So both have a eye uh, beacon that we yeah. have attached to us in this um, detectors in each room so it can see. Oh, Dan's, yeah, both Dan and Becky are, you know, not in the lounge, so turn all the lights off in the lounge. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Mm. Yeah. Um, you know, I know some of the guys have got other, you know, the security functions into Home Assistant when they're gone away, uh, and locks and all that sort of stuff. I don't know if I would go there yet. <laughs> it was, it's a quite a amount of uh, 
you know, a quarter of amount of scripting and programming to make it all work. Mm. Yeah, it'd be nice, but uh, not too sure yet. Yeah, I, I, I just want to make all my toys work nicely together. Yeah, yeah, I have our locks in, um, and I'm thinking about maybe not running the alarm on Home Assistant, but just an integration so that Home Assistant can say to the alarm, you know, please arm mm. or please disarm, but mm. no more than that. Yeah, we'll get a, a, a breach out of the alarm to do something else. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, but there's, you know, the locks and the alarm I want to always work. Yeah, that's something that has to be absolutely foolproof. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so that's why I went out and paid for a, you know, a proper alarm system. Um, and all the locks run by themselves, but I can also talk to them with yep. Home Assistant in various different ways. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, is yeah. Home Assistant's great for keeping tabs of things, so I'd probably not run the security system through it. Uh, just a bit more paranoid. <laughs> yeah, cause some people have you know moved into a house, um, ripped out the alarm system, and replaced the all the sensors with you know Home Assistant based sensors. But yeah, it's a bit. I yeah, I don't trust it a, enough mm. with you know all my stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got you know when we moved into the place. Had all the locks changed, so it's all one key. Mm. Um, new smoke alarms. I'd probably get some sort of smoke alarm that I can program into it. So, again, when I'm away, you know, it could send me a message through IFTTT or something like that. Yeah, and even to make sure you get woken up. Mm. Um, one thing I've bought, which I haven't installed yet, is a bed shaker. Oh, yeah. So it's basically yeah. just a big phone vibrating yep. motor. Um, they use them for... Yeah, you know, deaf people and things yeah, like that. Yeah, we, we use those at work and hook them into proper fire alarms and uh, disable bedrooms, have mm. them on their beds. Yeah. 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 yeah, so I've got one of those sitting there because um, our alarm system has a couple of smoke detectors. Yep. Um, and that's a always on zone. So yep. 24 7, it's going to, yep. the alarm's going to go off if it gets trapped. Good. Yeah, that's the way to do it. Yeah, so. so the alarm has a 12 volt output. So I'm thinking about just directly taking the 12 volt output. Yeah, yeah. So that way there's no technology in between. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, well, even on the, the sound or output for the outdoor siren, mm. probably a hook off, off that. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Yeah, because the, those are the things that, you know, fire and, you know, asset protection are the things you want to always, always work. Absolutely. Yeah, fire more than anything yeah. else. If, if your lights don't trigger when you walk in the house, meh. But, yeah, there are certain things that you have to rely on. Hmm. But if there's a fire and all of your lights come on, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, helps people. <laughs> yeah, helps people get out. You know. Yeah, maybe not on at a hundred percent because then you're probably just as blind as <laughs> <laughs> being dark. Yeah, true, true. That's one thing that I've actually built into a home assistant recently is when the any light gets turned on, it triggers an automation, mm -hmm. which then goes, "What time is it?" And if it's night time, it goes right forty percent. So that way you can walk around the house at night and not get blinded. I must, yeah, I must figure out how you've done that because today we had a power cut and, mm. of course, I came home and all the Philips Hue lights were on. <laughs> so yeah. something like that, but the opposite, you know, if the lights come on during the day, no, 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 it's not right. Yeah. Mm. Oh, thanks, Tim. It's been good to have a, have a chat with you about how you're using Home Assistant, but, you know, a bit of a more of a user perspective than... Um, most of the people that have been on the podcast so far that get ridiculously yeah. deep into everything. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely kudos to the the devs and all that. Uh, it's a great, great program. Yeah, it's been, it's, yeah, I think it was, yeah, it's been a few years that they've been running it now. And yeah, Palos has just been great at, you know, bringing the community together. And it, yeah, it is the home automation platform at the moment. Yeah, yeah, I had a wee play with OpenHab for a while, but. Yeah, I just oh. couldn't. Yeah, no, it was horrible. Yeah. But you know, learning uh, YAML, that was a, a bit of a mission as well, and it's still not. Indentation great. is very important. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that was the thing that I learned straight away. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Tim.